just give them a second to do that. Maybe start wrapping up your conversations because we have some announcements to go over. All right, y'all really got quiet like pretty fast, so thanks for that. <laughs> that was good. Um, first, I just want to say intercession on Sunday morning has been going so well. So if you have um, a heart for prayer, and uh, specifically over this church, and you want to get involved, please come at 9 a.m. Um, over in the A-frame building. It's in my office area. You'll just come to the front door. It's unlocked. We've been having a great time of just seeking the Lord together. And the presence of the Lord is there. And it's so good because you can, you can pray the heart of God. Um, so I would just invite you again to just come out to that. It's been really good just getting to pray with other people. I know we pray in our prayer closet at home. Um, but there's unity whenever we come together under the spirit of the Lord and pray his heart together. So I just want to invite you all out, that, um, out to that again and just say it's been going really good. So I hope that you'll join us. Um, the next thing I'm really proud of because it's my best friend, Faith. She's um, working full-time for Young Life in Murray, Kentucky. Uh, it's an amazing ministry of reaching high school students in Murray. And so they've seen countless kids come to know the Lord. And whenever um, they go to the school, and they're getting these kids to come. They're intentionally going after the kids who in no other way come to a youth group. These are the kids that are not raised in Christian families. These are kids that don't know who Jesus is. And they're being so intentional with creating a safe and fun environment for them to encounter um, the Lord together. So they're having a fundraiser for that organization. It is this Saturday. Um, from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., it's an all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast, so that sounds pretty good. Um, but if you want, there's information in the bulletin for that. There's a QR code that you can scan that will take you um, to their website and an info page about that. But it's in Murray at the United uh, First United Methodist Church in Murray is where it's hosted. So um, if you guys want to go and just support them, it's $10 for an adult, $5 for kids for all-you-can-eat pancakes. I hear rumor there's even chocolate chip pancakes. So if you guys want to get out there and just support them, that would be great. All right, our security team, this is not in the bulletin, so... Listen up, because you won't find the information anywhere else yet. But it's um, they're having their monthly meeting this Thursday at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. So if you're a part of the ushering team or the security team, um, just make sure you're here Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, I think that's it for our announcements, and we have a quick video to show y'all. Hi guys, I'm Naomi, this is Sam. We're part of Neighbors and Nations at YWAM Harbinen. And we believe that God is wanting to awaken a generation of young people in this nation. So, we are sending out traveling teams of young missionaries to tour every part of the UK with the goal to reach tens of thousands of young people, calling and empowering them to live all in for Jesus. Yes, but the thing is, we have a bit of a problem. In order to do this, we are going to need vehicles. We need vehicles! <laughs> we are looking to fundraise not one, not two, but £30,000 to be able to purchase two nine-seater vans to take us around the UK. So we wanted to come here and ask, would you consider contributing to this and believing with us for what God is doing in this nation? Boom. <laughs> Hi guys, many as you know, I'm Wyatt Martin. I've been a missionary with Youth with a Mission over in Kona for the past two and a half years. I've been able to come back home for about a month and a half now, and during this time, I've said yes to going to England. And I'm going to be one of those people in the teams that is going throughout the UK and seeing a generation rise up. Um, and with that, we need your help. Uh, and with uh, and I also personally need help with monthly support 
And so that's kind of me coming up here and just wanting to uh, just quickly ask that you guys pray with me. I leave, uh, I leave Paducah Thursday night, and then I'm on a plane Friday, and then we're headed to Europe. Never stepped foot there, but I'm expectant, and I'm believing that God is going to move. I'll be saying yes for uh, two years, and in that time, our plan is to go to, uh, I believe, almost every single church that will accept us there and just see the Holy Spirit just radically move there. UK used to be the number one most sending church in the world, and now it's one of the most dying. And that's not how churches are supposed to work, guys. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. That's not how uh, a body of Christ works. The body of Christ will live forever for those who dwell in him. And so let's see that. And I, I just ask that you guys just pray in partnering with me. If you guys want to meet at all this week, just come and find me. But if you feel led to give, I've got a QR code for monthly. If you guys want to give to the vans, just come find me. I've got a link that I can give you guys, and we can do it all online. Just come straight off your card. Um, and if there's other ways that you guys would like to do that, cash or stuff like that, we can get it figured out. If you want to sign up for my newsletter, that's also what we have up here. And then if you guys want to sign up, if you guys want an email link for that or just want me to take your information down, just come find me. I would love to do that. Sorry, it's a little bit quick. Uh, I don't have a lot of time. But just when you think of me, pray for me. If you want to help join my, my team, just holler at me, and I would love to get connected with you guys. Thank you so much. Hey, just, just stay up here, man. Uh, I'm excited about this. One of the greatest things we get to do here is get to launch out people into the world and into the nations, and we're constantly doing this, but we believe that um, as somebody goes, that we lay hands on them, we send them out and commission them from our church, and Wyatt is going to be going. Aaron, I want you to come up as well. This is going to be his last week. I want you to take about a minute and a half, share what you're doing, and share, and then we're going to pray over these guys. Hey, family. <laughs> um, so just real quick, uh, I just finished up with the School of Revival and Reformation. It was a nine-month Bible school. Uh, we, went, we went on a one-month outreach to uh, across the U.S., uh, just like we went to L.A., um, Nashville, Tennessee, Washington, D.C., and um, New York City. And our, our plan was to kind of just help bases go after Gen Z, and we wanted to end biblical illiteracy and Gen Z, and so that was kind of our vision for the outreach, um, and it was it went really well, um, but I'll, I'll talk less about that, and I'll just basically say what I'm coming into is I'm going back to YWAM Kona. I felt the Lord call me back there, um, and I'm going to do a school called the School of Worship. Uh, I just feel like the Lord has gifted me uh, with music and being able to share him with music, and I want to kind of hone that craft in for him um, and just learn better how to steward uh, the presence of God during worship and kind of just keep people centered on on the throne room. Um, and so I believe that's, a, that's what the school of worship is going to do for me. It's a three-month school. After that three months, I've been asked to help staff um, the school I just finished, the School of Revival and Reformation. And so that's another six months of, of staffing, helping um, just disciple students um, and uh, just grading their homework and things like that and then lead an outreach to hopefully uh, Mombasa, Kenya. Um, so that's the whole plan, super brief, uh, but I just, say, I'm asking for the same thing. I'm asking that you support me with uh, prayers. Um, I really, I really need a prayer team. I really need to be covered in prayer. I've noticed even this past outreach uh, how prayer really does change things, and so if you would just uh, reach out to me, and, and we can, and we can uh, connect on that, and I can give you prayer points. Uh, we can we can find a way to connect, whether it's after service or whatever. Um, and then I have a, a little thing um, out in the foyer uh, afterwards, after church. It's like a little adopt the box. It's kind of to help fun, fund the school of worship. You just go up. It's one numbers 1 through 77, and you pick a box to donate to, uh, whatever number. And what it, like say if it's 4, then it's $4. Um, and so I'm trying to get every one of those boxes filled, and that will help me almost cover all of school of worship. And so that's all I have for you guys. Thank awesome. you guys for the support and the prayers this far. Let's all stand up right now. Uh, we got some training going on, and then we got England, we got Kenya, 
And God's just going to do so much through these young men. Would you stretch your hands out as we just commission them and send them out? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity yet again to just lay hands on these two men of God uh, as they answer the call to go. Father, we just pray right now, Lord, that your anointing would be upon them, Lord. They go with the covering of this church, Father. Uh, we cover them in faith, Lord, and we send them out. We pledge, Lord, to be their prayer covering, to be their home base, Father, to be the home team that you need us to be, that they need us to be. But, Lord, I ask for fruit that would remain for the kingdom of God through their acts of obedience and submission. And we just pray the blessings of God over them, Lord, that many, many lives will be changed for the kingdom because of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. We love you all. Amen. I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Come on, give him a shout. Say, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just got a scripture. The Lord's just really been talking to me this week about um, Mary and Martha. How many you know about Mary and Martha? Uh, Martha was the busy one. She wanted to stay busy, and she was kind of getting a little frustrated with Mary because what did Mary do? Mary sat at Jesus' feet. She didn't get distracted about other things. She didn't care about her boat going out on the lake this weekend. She just wanted to spend time with Jesus. Come on, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good now. So let's just focus our thoughts on Jesus today. And I just want to encourage you. We're going to worship the Lord. And if you want to come down here and dance and just really get focused on the Lord, come on, man. Just get free in Jesus this morning. Amen.
Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. We should be the happiest people on earth. Amen. this week has been calling us out of brokenness and into wholeness because brokenness is not our inheritance we're sons and daughters of a living God and he hasn't called us to walk in brokenness anymore he's called us into new life and he's breathing breath of new life over this church and I see it and I feel it and I know that it's true because it's what he said and every word that he said is true no matter what you see you can stand on his word every day of the week and this week I, my prayer has been God I give you my whole heart and I accept your whole heart I accept your whole heart you are a good father God and you only have good for us no matter what we're seeing I'll praise because you're sovereign praise because you reign praise because you rose and defeated the grave I'll praise because you're faithful praise because you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord.
I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. You are my worship, I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship, you alone are worthy of my praise. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise.
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Guys, it's the first Sunday of the month, so we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper. Honestly, we could do this every week, and it wouldn't be enough for me. I'm going to ask those that's going to help serve the elements to come down here and begin to get ready. Here at Christian Fellowship, if you're a visitor, not only do we encourage you, we invite you to be a part of this with us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, um, you don't have to be a member of this church to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. But what I want us to do is obey the Scripture this morning. I, I want us to just close our eyes and let's just submit ourselves to the Lord, as Paul said, to not take this in an unworthy manner. Let's examine our own heart. Holy Spirit, we're here, Lord. Right now, God, we ask you, Father, to cleanse us, to purify us, Lord. Bring us back to center, to the blood of Jesus. Lord, it's the commonality. Lord, it's the foundation on which we stand here today. Lord, we ask, Lord, that we would not take this in an unworthy manner, Lord, but it would be exalting of the name of Jesus like the Word says, to proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So right now, Lord, our lives are Yours. Lord, this is a holy moment, and we submit ourselves to You. In Jesus' name, amen. There'll be someone standing in front of your respective sections. The front row will come, followed by each subsequent row, and after you've gotten the elements, we'll all receive together at the end. As we begin to worship, front row, go ahead.
All right, guys. I am flooded with the thought this morning, just overwhelmed with gratitude, I guess, for the family of God. You know, this isn't just my church family. This is my family. Honestly, in so many regards, this is more family than people that share the same blood in my veins. You may have come here alone this morning, but the truth is you're surrounded by family. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, they come to Jesus and it says, While he was still speaking, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. So here's blood family. And Jesus replied to the man who told him, I love this statement. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Now, first of all, I want to tell you, Jesus was not disrespecting his mother and his brothers, but he was bringing a true value on what's really important. And he stretched out his hand, like I'm doing this morning, and he said this, Here are my mother, here is my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Based on Jesus' words this morning, I'd like to share, we're amongst family today. There's something that binds us together, guys, and it's the very thing we're doing right now. It's the blood of Christ. You may have been an only child, but because of the blood of Christ, when you're in Christ, you have brothers and sisters. I'm thankful for the family of God, and I'm thankful for what it is that actually makes us the family of God. It's the blood of Christ. The Bible says, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he broke it, he gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for your broken body and everything that you purchased because of your broken body. Lord, I know there's a lot of people here today that need peace. There's a lot of people here today that need healing. There's a lot of people that are in need of a lot of things. But Lord, your broken body was intentional. You intentionally let it be broken and strategically did so that we could be heirs, Lord, and receivers of the promise. And we receive today with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. And in like manner, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do it as often as you eat and do it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for salvation and freedom and justification and restoration and redemption and everything, Lord, that you purchased through your blood. And Lord, I thank you for the family of God. I thank you that we never are alone. Lord, when we're in this room centered around Jesus, we are amongst true family. Lord, these are my brothers. These are my sisters. This is my mother. Lord, I thank you for the family of God. And I thank you that it's all possible because the blood you shed and we receive today with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Take you about two minutes. Shake a hand, hug a neck. Tell people you're glad to see them. Praise God. 
Guys, it's good to see you guys today, and I, I'm sure they're listening in this morning. Uh, a big shout out to Grant and Carly Tarnowski for bringing into the world Christian Fellowship's newest member, Miss Eliza Drew Tarnowski. Big congratulations to those guys. We're really happy for them. And one of the favorite things that I get to do as pastor is I get to hold all these brand new babies, and I love it. Such a cutie, and uh, just excited to see what God's going to do in her life. Uh, open up your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. Now we got a lot today out of town for the holiday, and I hope that you've got good family time scheduled tomorrow. And tonight, there's a phrase that has stuck out to me in Scripture for many years. And I think it's an accurate picture of what the church is supposed to be simultaneously. That's not how they meant it. But I want to start in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 6. This is about Paul and Silas in the city of Thessalonica. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, and there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this is Jesus whom I proclaim to you. He's the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And they attacked the house of Jason seeking to bring them out to the crowd. But when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authority, shouting, this is the phrase. Listen to this and mark it, hear it well. These men have turned the world upside down. And they've come here as well. Guys, Christianity is never supposed to be pushed to the corners of society. It's never supposed to be an afterthought in the way we live our lives. It, it's not supposed to be on down our list of priorities. When you've truly encountered the person of Jesus Christ, I can tell you, nothing, not one thing is more important than him. They were on a mission. And I'm telling you, they went all over the place totally consumed by the person of Jesus, by the message and the commission that he's given them, totally on fire through the power of the Holy Spirit, going from city and city, tearing the world upside down for Christ. Now they were saying this is a bad thing, but I want to submit to you this morning, that's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. When you see people get on fire for Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit, turning the world upside down. That's what God desires from his people. We're supposed to be a living organism, an active force in this world to be reckoned with. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. I love it because it's what God's called us to. I, I did a little study on what some of the disciples ended up doing. Uh, Peter left. He uh, first traveled to Antioch and established a community there. And he traveled extensively back and forth from Jerusalem to other places. Uh, history tells us he was ultimately martyred in the circus of Nero around 64 AD in Rome. Peter turned the world upside down for Jesus. His brother Andrew, many ancient traditions point to him as the apostle to the Greeks. He went and spoke to Greek communities and was eventually martyred at Petros on a cross in the shape of an X. 
If that's true or not, I don't know, but it's what history tells us. Uh, It's held that James, James the Great, was the first apostle to be martyred. In Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you can read about that. He died in 44 A.D. in Jerusalem. He turned the world upside down. John is the only of the original 12 disciples that did not die a martyr's death. He was banished on the Isle of Patmos in Greece, but he spread the gospel everywhere he went and was buried near Ephesus. John turned the world upside down. Philip, in the years following Pentecost, he ministered to Greek-speaking communities. Little's known about his adventures, but that he was martyred around 80 AD. He turned the world upside down. Little's known about the person of Bartholomew and his evangelization efforts. Various traditions have him preaching in different areas, but it was believed that he was martyred and his remains are currently located at the church of St. Bartholomew in the island of Rome. Thomas, the doubting apostle, uh, he was widely known for his missionary efforts to India, although there is some discrepancy there. Some Indians don't believe that. I personally do. And his tomb is now located at Mylapore, India, where he was killed for the gospel. Matthew, one of the four evangelists who's well known for his gospel that I read out of during communion, he preached to various communities in the Mediterranean before his martyrdom in Ethiopia. And his tomb is now at the cathedral in Salerno, Italy. James the Less, many people believe Uh, that he became the first bishop in the holy city. He was stoned to death there by Jewish authorities in the year 62 A.D. Judas Thaddeus, the forgotten apostle due to his name as it was also the same as Judas Iscariot. He preached the gospel in various places to the Armenian church, known as the apostle to the Armenians. He suffered martyrdom around 65 A.D., in what is now known as Beirut, Lebanon. Simon the Zealot is often depicted with Judas Thaddeus, and some people believe they uh, preached together as a team, but he was also murdered alongside him, history tells us. Matthias, he's the one that replaced Judas Iscariot. One tradition says that he founded a church in Cappadocia and spread the gospel there. And the Apostle Paul, the one that was untimely born in his own words, an apostle amongst apostles, the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. He literally abandoned all for the sake of the gospel message. These men and a myriad of others truly turned the world upside down for Jesus. What would it take to do this again? What would it take for God's people to do this again and to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. They did it. A dozen men did it. They turned the world upside down. What would it take for millions upon millions of Christians to do it again in the world today? Because I want to suggest to you that's exactly what God wants to do. That small band of people revolutionized the world. How do we do it again? I put a Facebook post about a little of these points this week, but I want to give you three simple points today. And if you're following along uh, in the YouVersion Bible app, these points are on there as well. The first thing that they had, guys, is this, and we must have this. If you're going to turn the world upside down for Jesus, you can't do it without this. And I want you to say this with me. They were full of the Spirit. Say it again. You see, Jesus gave them this commission and said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, making disciples of everybody, baptizing in the name of Jesus, teaching them all to obey all the things that I commanded you. But he then says, but wait. Tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And they did. And they waited and they waited and they prayed and they waited. And then finally in Acts chapter 2, the room where they were praying and waiting was shaken and it was a revival 
that started at that moment. Tongues of fire set up on each one of them, and that started a movement. The fullness of the Spirit changed them from the inside out, and I want to tell you the same things available to you today if you will be wise enough to seek the same fullness of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural signs and wonders followed them every single place they went. Why did that happen? Because Jesus told them it would be that way, Brother Wayne. He said, signs and wonders, these signs shall follow them who believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. What is that about? Why did he say these signs would follow them? I can tell you because we serve a supernatural God. And our task today, guys, is to bring people into a face-to-face encounter with a supernatural God. I think too often the God that we peddle is one that people think is impotent, that he has no power whatsoever. Could you imagine the book of Acts without the fullness of the Spirit being present? Could you imagine the book of Acts without the lame man being healed? And Peter and John saying, I don't have any gold, but what I do have I give unto you. Now rise and walk in the name of Jesus. Could you imagine the book of Acts being written without the power of the Holy Spirit being on full display? No. Could you imagine the book of Acts without Peter coming in and a dead girl being raised back to life? What was that? They were full of the Holy Spirit and consumed with the Holy Spirit, so much so that everywhere they went, signs followed them every single place. And it brought people to a face-to-face encounter with God. Now, you may disagree with me on this, and that's okay. You can stay in that wrong area. I say that with all love. Guys, I think one of the biggest failures in the modern day church is we have relegated Christianity into a philosophical argument that we debate with people. Instead of a supernatural movement empowered by the Holy Spirit that brings people to a face-to-face encounter with something they can't explain away. When you encounter God and encounter the power of the Holy Spirit, your mind probably isn't going to understand it, but you know you have experienced something and nobody can take that from you. They can't say, well, God doesn't heal. God doesn't do this. I have already seen too much to be convinced of something different. I am sick of it being an argument. Well, if it's an argument, well, what makes this better than this or this better than this? We serve a God of power. And if we're going to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ, it must begin with the same movement that started in them, that turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Now I can tell you, I can't produce signs and wonders. Do you know there's never been one person that's ever been born that has ever healed one person in their own strength? Not one person... (laughs) has ever raised somebody. Not one person has ever opened blinded eyes or made the lame to walk, but God can if we would have the faith and submit to His Spirit. The first thing they had was this. They were full of the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to turn the world upside down for Jesus, it must begin by us being full as well. My second point is this. They stayed on message. Would you say that with me this morning? Say it again. I see a change that took place in these men. And I'll be honest, people disagree with me on this as well. I can't be convinced otherwise. Prior to the crucifixion and the resurrection, these guys were consumed with one thought. What are you going to do about Israel? Now will you restore the kingdom to Israel, Lord? They followed him, consumed with that thought, the restoration of the nation of Israel. Over and over and over and over, Jesus could heal somebody. Well, what about Israel, God? This one blows my mind. In Acts chapter 1, 
even after Jesus has died and risen gloriously from the grave and showed up to them and said, go into the world, turn it upside down for me, be full of the Holy Spirit. He's about to ascend into heaven. There's not even going to be like God wires lifting him up. He's lifting up in the power of the Spirit right in front of their eyes. And what was their question? Will you it now restore the kingdom to Israel? Get over it, guys. Stop. Why are you so consumed with that thought? I am God in human flesh. I was just risen from the grave. Now will you restore the kingdom to Israel? I want to tell you something that happened, though. After Acts chapter 2, you never hear that again. Never one time from the disciples do you see them focused on the wrong message. They were so full of the Holy Spirit and they were on mission and they knew what their message was. It was the gospel and the kingdom. I want to tell you the church needs to hear this today. Quit diluting the gospel message that God has given us. Quit replacing the gospel message with something far less. He has given us a message. We go into the world and the Bible says it is the power of God unto salvation. Paul said don't expect me to talk about anything else. I will speak only of Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is God's message to the the world it'll change culture it'll transform a city I am adamant that's what I'm going to speak on they stayed on message we are diluting that message oftentimes we are replacing that message and it will not get the job done now what is that message Oftentimes you hear me speak, what is the gospel? What, what is that one message, the only thing that can transform culture? What is that message that these simple men took and transformed the world? What were they obeying God for? This is the message, and I want to speak about it. Jesus Christ came and did what you and I could never do. I want you to hear me in this. This might seem a little simple to you. You and I are in the place that Paul was in Romans chapter 7. When he said, hey, I know the things I ought to be doing, but I keep doing the things I hate. If I was going to star in my own autobiographical movie, that would be the tagline. I do the things I keep hating. <laughs> Who is going to deliver me from myself? Who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says this, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. He did what you and I could never do. He did it. If you think that you're saved by grace and then you work, 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 you're missing the point of it. Jesus Christ did every bit of it and delivered you from that old system. You're no longer under the law anymore. He fulfilled it and set you free from it. And now he offers you the message of grace because of his atoning work. Paul says in Romans chapter 9, that Jews didn't get it, that it was a stumbling block to them. Why is the message of grace a stumbling block? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Because of the law. Anybody else? Why would that message be a stumbling block to the Jews? Tradition. They wanted to earn their salvation. Who else? Stumbling, they keep, he said they keep tripping over it. They keep tripping over the gospel. It's a stumbling block. I'll tell you exactly what it is. Because they could not understand what grace was. They kept trying to produce it in their own flesh. They thought, and man, they had strict sex of the law too that took it to some of the most crazy degrees. 
it, it wasn't that I just couldn't work on the Sabbath. I, I couldn't lift my donkey up. <laughs> I, I couldn't do this. I had to take it and add law upon law upon law upon law. Why do we do that? Because we like what our flesh produces. And that, my friends, is anti-gospel. As a matter of fact, as he was writing the church in Galatia, he said, you got it. You understood what the gospel was. He used the phrase, you were running so well. You understood it. But then you fell back into, well, if I get circumcised, then God gives me just a little bit more favor. No, if your flesh gives you one ounce of more favor from God, you have left grace and have started following works. And that's not what it was. Now, the Jews, it was a stumbling block. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said, to the Greeks, it's foolishness. The world thinks we're a bunch of idiots. It's a foolish message. The Greeks, those that love philosophy, they love to talk about all these high things. He says to them, it's foolishness. They're not ever going to understand it. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block because they, they keep tripping over it. They don't understand grace and mercy. But I want to tell you, my friends, once you get the mercy and grace of God and experience it, it will change your life. Once you realize my very identity has been changed by the person of Jesus Christ, you'll never go back again. That is the message. I remember in high school, Man, I, I was an interesting person. I was a preacher's kid. I feel so sorry for preacher's kids. There are usually one or two categories. They're really, really good, or they push every envelope. Hello. <laughs> I got a really, really good one right here, actually. <laughs> the other one, that's yet to be seen. No, I'm just kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. I was pushing envelopes. I got in trouble when I was a freshman in high school. Fell in with the wrong crowd. Started drinking, doing all sorts of nonsense. We got in trouble for stealing things out of the courthouse in Murray. My friend, his grandma, was the circuit court court clerk in Murray at the time. We went in, we stole supplies to make fake IDs. And we gave it to this guy for free liquor. I was 14 years old. I told you PKs are one side or the other. This is who I was. Believe it or not, I got caught. Best thing that ever happened to me. I had grown up a preacher's kid. I'd heard my dad preach a thousand times, other pastors preach, but I never understood it. I never understood it. I just knew I wasn't good enough because my life didn't back up what I heard speaking. Well, I got busted because I was not the smartest kid on top of things. Gave some to somebody. They got caught. And the gig was up. I was on a school bus riding home from school, and I show up at the house, the last person off the bus. My dad's on the porch. He just said one sentence. He said, get in the car. And I said, sure, Dad. Where are we going? Get in the car. I get in the car. The door shuts. You could feel the tension. You could cut it with a knife. I had no clue that I was busted. And he said, I know what you've been doing. And I said, what are you talking about, Dad? I know nobody else ever did this, but I admitted to what I had to admit to. And that situation was in flux because I didn't know what I had to admit to. And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you what he said. He said, cut it. I'll just leave it at that. He said, cut it, Richie. I know what you've been doing. And he told me I've been discovered in my error. And I had one thought that permeated my brain at that time. 
I'm about to die. I am literally leaving this earth. I expected the spanking of a lifetime, the punishment of a lifetime, wrath, because that's what I deserved. But I'll never forget what I saw next, and I want to tell you, this is the reason I'm a Christian today. I look over at my dad, huge elephant tears are dropping off of his face. And he said, Richie, I'm worried about your soul. It wasn't harshness, mercy, or wrath, punishment. For the first time in my life, I experienced grace and mercy. And he started unraveling to me what the gospel actually was. And for the first time in my life, in my heart, I knew that God was real because of mercy and grace. And I can tell you, I'm not just making this up for a sermon. That is the reason I'm following Jesus today. It was the moment in my life when I experienced grace and mercy. Guys, there is a world full of people that is busted. They've been caught and found out. And they need that same mercy and grace that's only found through the blood of Jesus Christ. I think the disciples got it. I know they did. They had a whole slew of agendas. They had a whole bunch of things they personally wanted. But when they experienced mercy themselves... That became their message. There is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Started in Acts 2, after the great revival movement, Peter steps up and preaches to him. It's this Jesus. You crucified him. You nailed him to a cross. You're guilty. What should we do? We're cut to the heart. He said, repent and believe. And mercy flooded in. How did they change the world? They were full of the Holy Spirit. But the second thing is, they were absolutely consumed with the message of the gospel that the world needed, and they knew that he needed it. Everyone say this with me. They were full of the Spirit. Second thing, they stayed on message. The third thing is this. One of the greatest adjectives of the New Testament church, they were bold. Would you say that with me this morning? As you read through the book of Acts, this was the substance of most of their prayers. You can look in Acts chapter 4. After they got busted by the Jerusalem council and they told them, don't preach in the name of Jesus and all of these things, they got back together. They didn't say, God, take the persecution away. They never prayed that. They prayed for more boldness. They realized something. Christians can't shrink back. You got to be bold. You got to be bold about the kingdom. Can I tell you, and I don't say this offensively, I don't think that boldness is the problem with the modern day church. We're bold. I think we're bold about the wrong things. I wrote this on Facebook this morning and I believe it with everything inside of me and I cannot be convinced otherwise. If there's a phrase you've heard, you've all heard it. It's time to stand up. It's time to stand up. I agree. But what are we standing up for? Another passage that's oft quoted, we must obey God rather than men. And that's become a rallying cry of people, especially in this nation. Fight tyranny. Can I tell you, that's not what that verse means in context. What it actually meant. Now, if you want to interpret it wrongly, you can do that. 
But the way it's actually interpreted is, I am devoted to the message of the gospel and I'll lay down my life for it. I will not listen to you about that because I have a mandate to preach the gospel. I choose to listen to God. Guys, why is it that we can be bold about our own rights, but we can't be bold enough to surrender those very rights if it means advancement for the gospel? I knew that wouldn't be popular. You want to read about it, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul lists all of his rights. Every one of them. I have a right for this. I have this right. I have this right. I have this right. And then he makes one of the most bold statements in the Bible. He says, but I surrender it all for the sake of the gospel. What? How can that be so? It's because our souped-up American version of Christianity is not biblical Christianity. Guys, it's not about you and your rights. It's about the gospel. And if we don't believe the gospel alone can change culture, I'm out. Find another pastor. I will not stop this. It's about the gospel. we got to be bold about it. we got to step up and be bold. And when we're told to suppress that message, no, I will give my life for it because it changes culture. It transforms the world. It shakes the world at its core. It turns it upside down and puts it on its ear, being full of the Spirit, staying on message, preaching the gospel, and being bold about it. That's what they had. Now, we can replace that. We actually have replaced that. I'm not going to because I believe that that which once changed the world can change it again. There is no other path. There is no other path. Rid yourselves of fear and be bold in Christ. And a little side note, by the way, boldness is not rudeness or arrogance. That's not a free pass to be a jerk to the world, guys. Hear me. They prayed for boldness. Well, that way I can tell them off. Yeah, you're you're kind of missing Jesus' heart. Just just tweak that just a hair. That's not what boldness is. Boldness is death to self, and I'm all in with Jesus. Lord, I'll give my life for it. I want to tell you, I don't just say this. I mean it. I consider it an honor. I would consider it the ultimate honor to lay my life down for that message. I know I can't reason it out in my head a way that that's going to happen, I have thought for a long time, I'm going to give my life for this. At some time in my life, I will have to make a choice to lay it down for that message. And I'm telling you, your pastor is all in. If somebody held a gun to my head right now, I will lay my life down for the cause of Christ and consider it an honor. Man, you get that serious about Jesus. You get that on fire from the Holy Spirit. You stay on message that much. It's about the gospel, and you be bold about it and willing to lay your life down for it. The world will be shaken. The world will be shaken. Or we can keep playing church and doing our thing. I don't like church I love the church I love our church what I'm saying is I don't like church as a replacement for kingdom when an institutional organization becomes the sole definition of the kingdom we've missed it man Jesus is calling us to go all in to be solely focused 
to be so full of the Spirit that when we see a lame man on the side of the road in Draftonville, we stop and say, in the name of Jesus, rise up. And we see them get on their feet. It's not about the healing. It's about the one who gave the healing. It brings them to a face-to-face encounter. Oh my goodness, he's real. That's what changed my life. As I'm sitting in a car, shaking in my boots, fearing the rod of Richard Clendenin Sr. And I encountered Jesus in that car. Oh my Lord, you're real. You're real. Guys, I hope you hear me. I have scriptural references for everything I said this morning. It's what the world needs. They show up in Thessalonica. These people have turned the world upside down. They're bold. They're full of something I don't understand. And they got a message I've never heard. And they're bold about it. You want to shake a nation, that's it. That's it. That's how you do it. It's under the power of Christ. I'm not saying other things aren't important. So before I get a myriad of emails, okay, I place value on everything else. But the gospel's up here and everything else is like way down here. Everything else is way down here. There's value, but it's the gospel, man. I want the Holy Spirit to move so much in this place. Man, you wouldn't have a book of Acts without that. You wouldn't have a New Testament church without it. But do a study. If you can find in the Scripture where they went back to their old message, after that moment, I'll publicly apologize from the pulpit. It's not going to happen. They went all in from that point on. Lord, what about Israel? Tongues of fire. i got to go. <laughs> the fact, now, this might be meddling. The fact that we're so entangled in other things is proof positive. We're not full of the Spirit like we claim to be. But what about this? We need to actually... what. We need is to get more of the Holy Spirit to give us focus for what Christ has called us to do. And if we're focused over here, we are not full of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will fall, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other most parts of the earth. It doesn't say you will be full of the Spirit and you'll have a six hour service and nobody will want to go home. By the way, I like those services. But that's not proof of the Spirit. The proof of the movement of the Spirit is a witnessing to the person of Jesus Christ according to Scripture. You get on fire for Jesus and be solely focused. That's proof of the fullness of the Spirit. Now, I preached my heart today. Lord, if there's anything that Richie said that God didn't say, remove it and give me grace because I need it. But Lord, what I want is a movement to take place. Lord, I'm so sick of agendas. I'm so tired of less. I don't even care about my rights, Lord. I know that makes me a terrible person. I just want to give all that I have for the propagation of the message that changed my life. I get it, Lord. When Paul said, none of that stuff matters to me. I will, to the Jew, I'll become under the law. I'm not even under the law myself. But I'll become under the law that I can reach them. How do you do that? Because there's something more important to you than your own right. 
God, if I can be bold about my rights but not be bold about surrendering those rights for the gospel, i got a massive problem. It shows that I'm the Lord of my life, really. Help us. Help us. Lord, I've preached the truth. I've tried to speak it in love, Lord. But shake us that we can shake the world. Some of us are so deeply entrenched in nonsense that we can't even see anymore. We're so blinded yet claiming to have special vision. But the truth is we are blind ourselves. Open our eyes that we can see, Lord. We've allowed other things to replace you. We've constructed a gospel that fits into something that we like better. And that can be a myriad of things, Lord. But we've neglected what you actually told us to do. I pray those three things over this house, Lord, over my own life. I don't pray them on other people that I won't pray on myself, Lord. I pray for a fresh move of the Holy Spirit to fill us, that signs and wonders would accompany us, Lord, and follow us, Lord that they would become a platform that we could stand on to point people to the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for a focus, a laser focus of message. Protect the message that's coming out of our mouth, Lord. Give us an intentionality of focus towards the one thing that is the power of God unto salvation. God, shake us, shake us, shake us. Set us on fire. And Lord, right now I pray for a boldness, a new level of boldness like the disciples prayed in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 12. Give us boldness, Lord. But help us to be bold about the right thing. A soul devotion to the gospel and selling out even if it cost us our lives like it did these disciples I read about those that shook the world turned it upside down may it be said of us God forgive me forgive us for our own arrogance forgive us of our own foolishness and stubbornness forgive us Lord for being just like the Jews, for tripping over the message of the gospel. It's a stumbling block to us, always reverting back to works. Forgive us, God, for the simplicity of the gospel, becoming foolishness to us like it did the Greeks. And forgive us for operating in our own power and not under the power of the Holy Spirit that you've enabled us to function under. This is the central thrust of the book of Acts on. Full of the Spirit, preaching the gospel, being bold, and turning the world upside down. Give us ears to hear today, Lord. And give us hearts to receive. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I love you guys. Joe? I would like to say one thing. The word we heard today is straight from the throne of God. That's right. I've looked around in my life 
and I wanted God's will, but I wanted his will done my way. And I had to repent of thoughts in my heart about this country, about how it should be run, how the church should be run. And I ask for your forgiveness. The other morning, I was looking at a segment of news, and Mitch McConnell was on the news, and it was where he kind of spaced out. deep in my heart I thought yeah he's betrayed our country and he's done this and he's done that's what that's what he deserves (laughs) but the Lord put in my heart and he said I love him and you need to pray for him and I looked around and there's Schumer and Maxine Waters and Nancy Pelosi and these other people Truly in my heart, I didn't care for them at all. I really, really wanted to see them fall out dead, to be honest with you. But you know that's not God's will. That's right. His will is to save people. And so I've come to grips with this. Is the gospel, is the true message we need. My job is not to set this country right or try to straighten it out. But my job is to obey what the Lord asked us to do. And that's to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's right. And if we do that, you'll see the power of God rest upon us. (laughs) But he has no authority to do anything outside of that. But he did say, if you will preach the gospel, these signs will follow. Amen. And that's what we're needing for the world to be saved. Not our theology or not our goal in life, but His and Amen. His alone. Amen. So, thank you. That's right. Let's go. Uh, so appreciate those words and uh, once God opens up your eyes to what it's about man we got a job to do and the cool thing it's just like Joe said I've got opinions too and they probably line up with yours but God has a heart for this world when it said the most quoted verse in the Bible for God so loved the world he still does and Jesus has a heart that not willing not being willing for one of them to perish, but for everybody to come to repentance. And it's our job to ensure that that message gets out there. Guys, I love you. You can be dismissed today. Hope you have a blessed Labor Day weekend. We'll see you next week right here at 10 a.m.